Oh, meeting is now streaming live on custom live streaming service. There it goes. Okay, uh, welcome one and all to the first uh, Zo official Zoom meeting of the Environment and Transportation Committee. I am, as always, your friendly chairman, Kumar Barve, and I'm joined by uh, my vice chair, Dana Stein, and um, de definitely majority of the committee. Uh, and let me begin by welcoming to our committee uh, a newcomer, uh, Delegate Marvin, Mar Marlon Amprey. Marlon, uh, welcome to the ENT committee. Uh, because you were not at, in the, uh, because you were not in the organizational meeting, you didn't get the memo that you have to wear a tie. So we'll let you slide this time, but uh, you got to wear a tie. So uh, I, he and I. Were two ships that passed in the night. We tried to uh, uh, we tried to contact one another. All I know about him is that he passed the bar exam, so he must be a smart guy. So there. Uh, any in any case, um, we are losing Dahlia Tar, which is uh, a terrible shame. But she's going to the Ways and Means Committee. I was there for eight years. It'll be great for her career. Uh, she'll enjoy it. Anne and I enjoyed our time on that committee. And Healy, uh, you know, and I enjoyed our time in that committee, and she'll do really well there. I think she's going to do well wherever she uh, ends up going. So, so a couple of basic rules. First of all, your camera has to be on. Uh, that's uh, I'm talking to you, Jay Jalisi. Uh, your camera has to be on, uh, and it has to remain on. So, for example, I don't want to see anybody doing this, where um, you know it just says Chairman Kumar Barve. Um, I, the camera has to be on. I understand that you're going to need to get up and maybe grab a snack or or do something. Just leave your camera on and uh, come back into the uh, window when you can. Uh, when you can. Uh, the next thing is the rules for the hearings are going to be four minutes for sponsors and two minutes for everybody else. Now, I, I, I'm I'm unsure. At, as a host, I can see the little timer on the left of my screen. Maybe you can or can't, but uh, I'll call it out. The way we're going to do this is for sponsors, we're just going to have a two minute timer. And then when the two minutes runs out, we'll restart it for another two minutes because two plus two equals four. So uh, that's the way we're going to work that. And um, finally, before I call up the first uh, uh, sponsor and the first witness, uh, I do want to uh, pass along a little bit of sad news that uh, the vice chair told me. Apparently, uh, former delegate Andrew Castley's uh, dad passed away. And, uh, you know, Andrew's no longer a member of our committee, but he's always a member of our family. And so on behalf of the entire Environment and Transportation Committee, we offer our condolences to Andrew and his family. Uh, uh, he's, uh, his dad certainly did a good job raising him. So, uh, 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 Andrew, if you're out there somewhere, uh, we're thinking about you. We have you in our prayers and thoughts. So uh, with that, let me begin with uh, the first bill. Um, by the way, um, as far as bill order is concerned today and into the future, I'm going to try and hold to um, as much as possible numerical order. We're not doing that this uh, today, but for the most part, the bills are going to be in numerical bill order unless there's a compelling reason to switch up the order. Typically, that would be because some witness uh, had to leave to get on an airplane. But since we're doing this all by Zoom, it's going to have to be some very compelling reason why we have to take them out of order. So I'm going to try to stick with numerical order. And having said that, I'm going to violate that rule right off the bat with House Bill 250 by Delegate uh, David Frazier Hidalgo. David, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Vice Chair and members of the committee. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting to be the very first one up with the bill, <laughs> the very first Zoom of 2021. So um, with that said, let me make it, um, make, it, make it abundantly clear. This bill is simply the same exact bill that we passed last year. House Bill 250 is commercial motor vehicles inspection station inspections. Um, and it's in the same exact posture we passed last year. And essentially, uh, Maryland currently requires class E and F vehicles to receive an inspection every 25,000 miles or 12 months, whichever occurs first. Class F vehicles are commonly known as tractor trailers and class E's are straight trucks. HB 250 would change the class F um, to preventive maintenance inspection requirements 
um, for vehicles less than five years to every 35,000 miles or 12 months, whichever comes first, which is a little bit more in line with what a lot of the other states are doing. Long haul trucks can run up to 100 to 125,000 miles uh, per year. Current inspection requirements were required four to five inspections per year. Average increasing the mileage requirement on inspections of the tractor trailers, classes F, to 35,000 miles would ease the financial cost to long haul trucking companies. And as trucks, more and more trucking are, trucks are coming out, they're getting safer and safer and safer. So that's the reason for the bill, um, because zero emission vehicles require less maintenance and internal combustion engine vehicles, HB 250 would increase the inspection mileage requirements for ZEV straight trucks only class E to 50,000 miles or, or, um, or, or 12 months, whichever occurs first. ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles would remain the same at uh, 25,000 in miles. And with that said, um, Mr. Speaker, if I could turn it over to my witness, I would appreciate it. That's Mr. Chairman to you. Uh, let me just um, uh, emphasize something. All the bills we're hearing today, tomorrow, and I think the next two days are gonna be bills that passed the House of Delegates and ran out of time because of COVID on the other side. So these are bills that are prepared to go. I mean, th these are bills that are most definitely gonna pass. So I just wanna say that as, a, uh, as an upfront here. So with that, uh, the only other uh, witness is Lewis Campion with the motor truck uh, uh, trucking industry. Uh, Lewis, welcome to the back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Delegate Frederick Hidalgo for sponsoring this bill. Um, again, it's a great opportunity to promote the adoption of safer equipment that is better for the environment by rewarding companies who use newer vehicles. Um, really, this will reduce a long haul motor carriers inspections um, by approximately one per year. So they still would be getting inspected four to five times per year. Just to put that in context, in federal law, carriers only have to inspect their trucks once per year, no matter how many miles they travel, which means every truck that comes into Maryland only is getting inspected once per year but Maryland trucks are going through a much more rigorous process where they're getting four to five inspections per year. So we've really created a disincentive for companies that might have multiple multi-state locations to register their vehicles in Maryland. When you, hopefully you'll pass this bill as you did last year. And if you do, we'll still have the strictest inspection laws in the country by far. We're simply asking for a 10,000 mile increase in the increment Again, these vehicles are safer, they're newer, they come equipped with things like LED lighting and anti lock brakes and lane departure warning. All of those safety features, much more environmentally friendly uh, as uh, the sponsor alluded to. So uh, we would just ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Very good then. Are there any questions uh, for this bill that we passed last year without any muss or fuss? See on, I believe we will move on to the next bill. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. The next bill is House Bill 80, uh, 87, Delegate Jones. Delegate Jones, where are you? Trish, where is she? Hmm. Dana Jones, there she is. Chairman, how are you, sir? Doing great. You know, I, before you start, I just want to say that I still remember you as a young 20-something at the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles in 2000. And um, you look you look the same, so that's a positive thing, so. Well, the, the hearing's already off to a great start. There you go. <laughs> there we go. So let me just uh, emphasize again, it's gonna be four minutes for you. There's a timer. I don't know if you can see it, but it's, only, it's set at two minutes and we'll go through it twice because as I explained earlier, two plus two equals four. And um, your witnesses will be able to testify for two minutes. And I just want you to bear in mind that this is a bill that passed the House of Delegates uh, last year, and uh, it just ran out of time on the Senate side because of COVID. But with that, take it away, uh, Delegate uh, Jones, and welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, Chairman Barbe, Vice Chair Stein, and members of the Environmental and Transportation Committee. 
I come before you today to reintroduce a bill which has been important to many in Annapolis and Anne Arundel County, also throughout the state, a bill which offers a simple solution to a dangerous problem. Many of our students are faced to ride on overcrowded school buses that don't have enough seats for all students, with some students even having to stand in the aisle or sit on the floor of the bus. This goes against the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's recommendation that all school bus passengers be seated while, school bus, while a school bus is in motion. This bill initially came about when, my, when parents in this district reached out to my predecessor, Delegate Alice Kane, about this problem after their concerns were dismissed by school district officials that use state law as the rationale for overcrowded buses. As you all know very well, the session was cut short, not giving this common sense piece of legislation a chance to get across the finish line uh, and over into the Senate. It did pass the House, as the chairman uh, noted unanimously, uh, one day before session ended abruptly for COVID-19. News reports from uh, prior to the pandemic have confirmed that this is a problem in several counties. A 2019 performance audit of Anne Arundel County Public Schools found the school system not managing its transportation services efficiently and suggested that overcrowded buses could be solved through the application of routing software that they already own. The bill includes an amendment made last year, which would allow for the limit of students to temporarily exceed seating capacity in cases of emergency, as long as it is corrected in a reasonable amount of time. I respectfully urge a favorable report on this simple common sense bill that would keep our children safe as they travel to and from school. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Delegate Jones, just let me, um, um, uh, confirm this. The bill is the same as it was it's in the same form as it was when it passed the House of Delegates, correct? Yes, Chairman. Oh, oh I can't hear you, sir. Oh, there you go. I, I, I muted myself by mistake. Uh, yeah, th thanks a lot. Any questions? Uh, yes, Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Delegate Jones, uh, a couple of the written testimony mentioned um, that requested a, an amendment to strengthen the emergency provisions so that it, it can't be used, it can only be used as a genuine emergency, it can't be used as an excuse. I think one of them said poor planning is not an emergency. Um, is there any thought to strengthening those or what's your uh, view on that? I, I, I understand um, and honestly the, um, I, I, it, it Part two here, an emergency or other temporary situation caused by the number of people on a school bus to exceed the seating capacity of the bus. And this is again for uh, last year in committee, it was brought up, what if a uh, parent or caretaker cannot uh, pick up a child at, normal, at a normal bus stop and calls a friend and says, could you, you know, can they please go home with your child? It would be just for those instances or if a school bus broke down and another bus helped you know, pick those children up. Um, any, if the committee uh, sees fit to strengthen that and, and truly clarify it, I of course would um, be fine with that um, to truly outline that it would be in fact for emergency only uh, situations to be dealt with in a reasonable period of time. Uh, Delegate Jones, is there a Senate cross file? Yes, there is. Senator Elfrith. Oh, so, okay. All right. Um, you know, my preference is to just pass it as it passed last year. Uh, obviously, I'll be guided by, by you and the members of my committee. I, you know, if, if, it, if there's a strong feeling about that, maybe they can amend it on the Senate side and, you know, uh, if we all agree, we can accept that. But I'd kind of like to pass the bill out as as quickly as possible. Uh, but we'll, we'll all talk about that. Uh, any other questions? I don't see any hands. So why don't I go to Joanna Tobin? Joanna, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chair Barve, Vice Chair Stein, and members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 87. My name is Joanna Bates Tobin. I'm a parent of a member of the class of 2020 at Annapolis High School. I'm an also, also an educator and a recently elected member of the Anne Arundel County Board of Education representing the Annapolis area. The views I'm expressing are my own and not the Anne Arundel County Board of Education's. 
I'm here today to urge you to support this bill. It is essential to secure the safety of our children as they ride buses to and from school and to school-related activities. Allowing children to stand or crouch on a moving bus is clearly not safe, nor is it appropriate except in an emergency. Having a statute on the books that allows for our children to stand while a bus is moving speaks to a disregard not only for their safety, but also for their dignity as human beings. Our children deserve better from us. The need for this bill first came to my attention when I heard a parent testifying before the Annapolis Education Commission say that when she had called the schools to complain that her child's bus was consistently overcrowded and students were forced to stand, the response was that the state law allowed children to stand on moving buses. I was able to bring this to former delegate Alice Kane's attention and she first introduced a bill to remediate the situation during last year's abbreviated legislative session I'm now very grateful to Delegate Jones for reintroducing this bill for the 2021 session. Passing the bill is particularly important to students in the Annapolis area. We are a largely urban district with a dense population. We also have a significant areas of concentrated poverty. This means that we have a high number of students who depend entirely on bus transportation to get to and from school. It is therefore especially important that to ensure their transportation is safe and well-regulated. Let me conclude by saying that if you pass this bill, you will be sending a powerful message to our young people that we value them and their safety. As a parent and an educator, one of the most important lessons I have learned is that children do what you, don't do what you say, they do what you do. In passing this legislation, we are not just saying that we care about our children's safety and that they should too, we are putting our words into action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is um, Lauren Booth, I believe. Is Lauren there? Hello. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Um, my name is Laura Graham Booth, um, and I serve as the Ward 7 representative to the Annapolis Education Commission, which Joanna just mentioned. Um, one subject that has been brought to us repeatedly over the past several years is overcrowding on our public school buses. Um, at a meeting last year, one parent testified that she had called Anne Arundel County Public Schools uh, Transportation Department to report that there were not enough seats on her child's bus for all the students. The person she spoke to responded that it was not against state law for students to stand in the aisles while the bus was in motion. To say that we were flabbergasted would be a gross understatement. Now, if I as the parent drive my children to school, I must adhere to the state laws regarding vehicle capacity and seatbelt usage, as well as guidelines for car seats and booster seats. But if I put my same children on a school bus, apparently none of these reasonable and responsible safety measures apply. My son has been told by a bus driver to just crouch down when there are no empty seats. There is no legal obligation for school, bus, uh, for school systems to find additional buses to tra transport students and increasing transportation costs have caused school systems such as Anne Arundel County to turn a deaf ear to parental complaints such as these. In the previous version of this bill, which I testified on last year, there was no language that permitted standing on buses in case of emergency, such as an evacuation due to a threat. While I agree that this may be necessary, I urge you to include specific language which states that this is only permissible in case of emergency and should not be used as a justification to allow overcrowded buses to run under everyday conditions. I urge you to make our laws more consistent with regard to child safety. Uh, please end this dangerous practice of permitting students to stand while the bus is in motion. Further, I urge you to set reasonable measurements for school bus capacity. In our discussions at the Education Commission, we have heard that elementary school buses, stu school students may be expected to sit three to a seat, which does not give, provide enough capacity for older students who are larger and frequently carry backpacks, lunch boxes, et cetera. Parents and taxpayers deserve oh, to know Sorry, You're there are two minutes. Yeah. Thank you. There are precautions are taken. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And let me just uh, call up Lisa Van Buskirk, and then we can uh, entertain questions. Lisa, are you there? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, okay. Chair Barve, Vice Chair Stein, and members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 87. I'm Lisa Van Buskirk, the leader of Start School Leaders Maryland and Anne Arundel County chapters. School transportation is the tail that wags the dog of safe, healthy, and age-appropriate school hours. Thus, I pay attention to school transportation issues in Maryland. My written testimony includes additional statements. The 2019-2020 school year brought more complaints than usual about overcrowded buses with students standing or sitting in the aisle around Maryland. 
In reviewing the language of the proposed bill and the version passed by this committee and the House last year, it appears that the provision to permit standing in the aisle has been maintained. Standing in the aisle should only be permitted during true emergencies, and the bill should be amended to state the limited conditions for when standing in school bus aisles is acceptable. School systems must understand that poor planning does not constitute an emergency. To my knowledge, there are zero safety systems on a school bus for children standing or sitting in the aisle. There's nothing, nothing to prevent a student in the aisle from being thrown from the rear of the bus all the way to the front windshield in an accident. Maryland law permitting students standing in the aisle on a regular bus violates the recommendation of NHTSA and common sense. Opponents may argue that this law will cost school systems more money as they may need to hire more bus drivers or purchase more buses. This is a false assumption, as I would argue that the overcrowding on buses stems from a lack of regular review of school bus routing for accurate ridership. In 18 of Maryland's 24 school systems, a lack of methodical review of bus routes was cited in their most recent Office of Legislative Audit Review. For most jurisdictions, this was the second or even third time the OLA made this recommendation. Maryland has been recommending using routing software for schools since the 1975 report of the task force to review public school people transportation. 46 years later, it's time we hold them accountable to that recommendation. Anne Arundel County Public Schools hired a company to do a transportation audit with a report released last January. Overall, the existing routing for AACPS had so many inefficiencies that AACPS could save millions of dollars through regular oversight and review of its bus routes. If you they could, uh, yeah, if you could just begin to wrap up, that'd be terrific. Yes, sir. Uh, might other school systems similarly benefit from reviewing school bus routes to comply with this law? Please amend House Bill 87. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, okay, seeing no questions, thank you very much. That concludes the public hearing on um, House Bill uh, 87. I will say that uh, I forgot, I neglected to tell the members of my committee that uh, when I asked for questions, I forgot to tell them to all put up their hands to freak you out there, uh, Delegate Jones. Apparently they failed the oldest joke in the book and we screwed it up. So. Well, this being my first ever uh, bill hearing, I, I would have appreciated that and uh, expected that from you, sir. So thank you, friend. Sorry to let you down. Okay, <laughs> uh, let's go next to um, House Bill 118. Uh, Delegate Stein, the vice chair's uh, the sponsor of the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, committee members. This bill is nearly identical to the, the, the bill that we passed on this topic last year and uh, was approved by the House unanimously. It fills a gap in existing law by providing penalties, appropriate penalties, when drivers hurt or kill a vulnerable road user. So what this bill does is define vulnerable individuals to include lots of different uh, uh, types of individuals, walkers, cyclists, wheelchair users, parent pushing a stroller, or highway worker. So the bill says that if a driver kills or seriously injures such an individual, they're subject to more substantial fines than they are currently. A fine of up to $2,000 with the possibility of license suspension, well, we'll have the license suspended for at least seven days and not more than six months and maybe subject to other penalties. And one of the witnesses is someone who is an expert on the issue and also someone who was hit by a car while biking and seriously injured. And unfortunately, the driver only received a $110 fine, even though he admitted that he was just trying to beat the bicyclist through the intersection. There is one small change from last year's bill and Mr. Chairman, in, in the interest of trying to conform it to the bill that we've already passed, I'm happy to, to, to waive that one change, it just was, a phrase that is deemed to be redundant and the committee council signed off on, but uh, can happy to sort of move it back to the posture it was last year. Well, I mean, is it is it a substantive change or just a stylistic change? It is a substantive change. I guess I, I if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, I can take a no. few seconds to explain it. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask you about it anyway. Sure. In Section B, uh, last year's bill, uh, it said an individual may not cause the serious physical injury or death of a vulnerable individual as a result of the individual operating a motor vehicle in a careless or distracted manner or in violation of any provision of this title. So what this, what this year's bill does is take out the phrase in a careless or distracted manner because the thought is that it, that's a standard that's covered by the phrase that says in violation of any provision of this title. So- Sounds, sounds like a stylistic change to me. Okay, that 
Sure. I that I guess in a sense it um, it to take out a redundancy. Um, sure, we can consider it a uh, happy to consider it as a uh, stylistic change. Okay. Well, we'll talk about it more. Um, uh, let me go to the witnesses you have signed up in favor of it. Uh, John Corin, uh, Nigel Samaru, uh, John Sabiga, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Chief Joanne Rund. Uh, Mr. And, Chairman, I'd like to um, first ask Joanne Rund, who's okay. run the Fire Department Chief for Baltimore County, to, to speak. Okay. All right, Joanne, you have the floor. Assuming you're on it. The waiting chair. Can you hear me, everyone? Can you see me? There you are. Yep, we can see you and hear you. Awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, I am very much in support of House Bill 118. Thank you for Delegate Stein for placing this forward. Um, the Baltimore County Fire Department has over 3,000 career and volunteer personnel that represent um, the county when responding to roadway incidents. We've had over 12,228 incidents over the last year. When we analyze these incidents, 2,264 of those incidents are actually on highways with speeds of over 50 miles an hour. It's extremely important that when we do these, um, when we're responding on these incidents, that people are acknowledging that we're working on the side of those incidents and that we take account for the risks that are put in place. Operational roadways are high risk and high frequency events. Um, with distracted driving, drivers under the influence, along with the road weather conditions, conditions and other uh, distractions, firefighters are much more at risk now than ever. Every day, there are reports of firefighters, EMS workers, police officers, and tow truck drivers being killed on roadside incidents, not to mention all the near miss incidents that would have been fatal. Responders are being struck while working on these roadway incidents to take care of our citizens daily. There has been a national urgency for all fire chiefs across to provide safety alerts and training programs regarding safe, uh, roadway incidents. On a personal level, I have experienced this with a fellow public safety member being struck along Route 32, and this driver was only punished for $310 of negligent driving and speeding. Unfortunately, we lost the life of that public servant. It is our hope that House Bill 118 is passed. It will help act as a deterrent to driving while distracted and help reinforce the move over laws we have in place today. It is for this reason that I respectfully ask for a favorable report on House Bill 118. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, who would you like to have go next? John Corrin or Nigel or um, who, who'd like to go next? The order on the list is John Corrin, Nigel Samaru and John Sabiga in that order. And also Peter Wilbon. Wilbon. I believe John Sabiga was up, supposed to be up next. Okay, well, whoever wants to go next, uh, go ahead. Is John on the call? You know what, um, let, let's let's go to you, John, Mr. Corrin, uh, to keep things moving along. We'll pick him up when we uh, uh, see him. Okay, very good. Uh, my name is John Corrin, uh, thank you. Uh, chair, uh, vice chair and sponsor of Stein and the entire committee. And thank you all for doing the important work you're doing under these challenging times. And also thank you for uh, two years uh, past for unanimously passing uh, this bill. Um, I just wanna make a couple of points. One is I served on the uh, 2017 bicycle task force created by the legislature. And this was the number one recommendation out of that task force. Um, I, I, I'm sad to report that the, the numbers are still going the wrong way. Through the first three quarters of 2020, there were 100 pedestrian and bicyclists killed on Maryland roadways. That's up from 96 for the first three quarters of the year before, even in light of way less vehicle miles traveled by drivers due to COVID. So unless you're uh, not sure what the problem is, that, 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 we're, that our numbers are going the wrong way. This law, in addition to the penalties, will act as a foundation for a safety campaign to encourage drivers to, to um, raise their duty of care when in the vicinity of anyone lawfully using our roadways that is outside of a vehicle. I ask once again 
for your favorable support uh, for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nigel, I see you're there. So why don't we take you next? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Barve. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman Stein, distinguished members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. My name is Nigel Samaru. And on behalf of myself and Bike Maryland, I would like to thank you for allowing me to address you today regarding what I feel to be very important and needed legislation. Yeah. On July 20th of 2017 in Columbia, Maryland, I decided to do a quick 20 mile bike ride when I was T-boned by someone driving a minivan, resulting in a broken neck and paralysis on my right side. I was transported to shock trauma where I underwent surgery. I have since regained the use of my right side, but I now suffer in constant 24 seven pain on the left half of my body and right arm, hand and shoulder. I'm left with permanent damage to my spinal cord, which will require monitoring for the remainder of my life. The driver received a $110 ticket and a fine for this crash. Currently, there's no legislation that would warrant a second look at those individuals who hurt someone through their negligent driving. I ask for your support for this needed legislation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Are either Peter Wilborn or John Sabiga present? Okay, apparently not. We'll Kumar, I, uh, Peter Wilborn is just coming in now. Oh, okay, all right. Well, what about John Sabiga? Um, I don't have him in the waiting room. Okay, well, it is what it is. Okay, uh, let them in, uh, put them up uh, as soon as you can. Uh, Peter Wilborn is now in. Okay, great, Peter. And so is John Zabiga. Okay, well then let's take John first uh, since his name is first on the list. John Zabiga, uh, you've got the floor, two minutes. I don't see him or Peter for that matter. Mr. Chairman, I saw John in the box with the phone up there and he's muted. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know how to communicate to him that he's muted. But. Uh, yeah, and I can't unmute a phone, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, it's a star six from the phone, but I, I'm not certain of that. Well, how Peter about- Peter's trying to connect the audio. Looks like John is now I'm connecting. I'm unmuting. Okay. John, are you there? Good afternoon. Can you, I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you, can you hear me? Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. My name is John Sabig. I'm the president of Baltimore County Professional Firefighters Association. I am following Fire Chief Joe N. Run, who uh, so eloquently put the position that um, as emergency responders, we find ourselves in on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, being in the field and a member for 32-plus years and operating on the field, uh, Baltimore County covers county roads, state roads, and interstates, obviously. And every day, our members are required to operate on emergency scenes. We believe this bill, House Bill 118, with a favorable report, would be an asset and give a little bit of teeth to those folks that choose to be inattentive and distracted while driving. We look forward to a favorable report and thank you so very much for the opportunity. And this technology is, is trying. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Is Peter Wilborn there? Peter? Hi, well, this is Peter. Yes, can you hear me now? I can, yes. And thank you see. so much. Hi, this is Peter Wilborn. I am a Maryland lawyer and the founder of Bike Law, uh, a network of bicycle okay. crash attorneys across the country. I handle bike, bike crashes in Maryland and across the country and have dealt with hundreds of them in my career. Uh, um, I hear a lot of noise in the background. Somebody... I'm gonna unmute myself, that looks better. Um, here's, the, here's the situation. Uh, there is one demographic of people in which traffic safety is getting worse and that's vulnerable road users. We see it across the country where there's more fatalities and more catastrophic injuries for vulnerable road users than any other class. So there is a problem that needs to be addressed. And I'm gonna, I guess the best way to do this is give you an example. If, if a cyclist or pedestrian, if a cyclist is killed in a bike lane or pedestrian is killed in the crosswalk, law enforcement uh, is left with a very stark choice. Do they penalize the driver 
with a failure to yield essentially a traffic ticket, or do they reach for the very, very serious crime of a felony homicide? Uh, most crashes don't fit in either. So what happens now is that folks are getting that lower uh, failure to yield. Uh, I have trained law enforcement, I've dealt with prosecutors and judges across the country, and they are looking for something else. In states that have VRUs, it meets that need perfectly, because the problem is with very few drivers, but the criminal process or the, the court process is supposed to have a deterrent effect. Uh, if someone mails in a failure to yield ticket, never appears in court, then we're not solving the problem that's creating the endemic a problem of death of vulnerable road users. If they have to appear in court, then the judge is given the discretion to give community service, to sentence, to take their license away. So we're addressing the problem and making the road safer for all Maryland citizens. Okay, thank you very much uh, with th 13 seconds to spare. Before I get to questions, we're, we're doing this for the first time and I just wanna, I'm wondering of the uh, witnesses, are you able to see the timer on the Zoom link? Are you able to see that? Yes, we see. Yes, it. sir. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. I just wanted to. Okay, uh, questions. Any questions? I don't see any questions. So I will assume there aren't any. And thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the public hearing on House Bill 118. Let's proceed to Delegate Stein's next bill, uh, House Bill 296. Mr. Vice Chairman, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and committee members. So as, as with all the other bills uh, in the schedule today, this is reintroduction of a bill which uh, was approved by this committee and, and the House uh, approved uh, 130 to zero last year. And as you may recall, I introduced this bill in response to the tragedy that befell the Friedman family who lost a family member two years ago due to the poor driving of an elderly driver. Now, several states have implemented measures to try to ensure that older drivers still have the ability to drive safely. A dozen states require more frequent license renewals for older drivers. Maryland doesn't do that. Um, just like everyone, older drivers renew their licenses every eight years and have the option of renewing by mail every other renewal. But one, one measure that some states have implemented is a requirement that older drivers renew in person for each renewal. The mail-in option is not available. And there are 13 states that have this requirement on the books. And it turns out that there is proof that this requirement is effective. The Journal of the American Medical Association found in a 2004 study that this in-person renewal requirement actually has an impact in reducing elderly driver fatalities. It reduces fatalities by 17%. Um, and a copy of that study is attached to my, my testimony. The study didn't, didn't identify the reasons by which this in-person license renewal is related to a reduced fatality rate, but the authors had a couple of theories, one of which is that potentially un unsafe drivers may be less likely to reapply for a license when facing in-person renewal. They just may forgo the license renewal process altogether. So, this bill would implement a requirement that drivers age 85 and above renew in person for each eight year renewal of their license. And um, also attached to my testimony is MVA's most recent stats on crashes involving drivers age 65 and above. And it shows that uh, between 2015, 2019, total number of crashes involving those drivers went up by 24%. And uh, while the number of fatal crashes remained about the same, the number of injuries went up by 19%. So for these reasons, I urge favorable consideration of this bill. And Mr. Chairman, uh, one of the witnesses who had signed up uh, to testify, Rabbi Yitzhak uh, Friedman, uh, had a commitment at two o'clock, so he's unable to testify. He's, he asked if I could read his statement. Sure, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, again, this is from uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Friedman. Uh, my wife was walking home from synagogue and she was run over by a motorist that was 89 years old. The police report indicated that the driver wasn't aware of my wife's presence. There were no signs of the driver having applied the brakes prior to the collision. He told my neighbor that he had hit a little girl. My, my late wife was five feet, five inches. How was this driver allowed to operate a motor vehicle? After my wife's passing, I was not upset at the driver. He probably didn't realize the slow decline in his reaction speed. However, when he refused to give up his keys, I was incensed. 
However, in thinking about it, I realized that it must have been hard for him to admit to his frailty. So why didn't his family step in? Not every spouse or child is up to the hard love it takes to face a loved one who have used the car as his key to independence. We tried taking the keys from my own mom, but she was in denial. My aunt just fired her doctor for suggesting that she not drive at night. It didn't bother her that this doctor knew her for 50 years. He is her first cousin. My physician says that people that can hardly walk are routinely on the road. However, he can only suggest that they get retested. With doctors and family at a loss to handle the situation, what can be done to convince seniors that are no longer able to drive to give up the keys? This piece of legislation presented before you is that first step. Civil rights are critical and we should not discriminate by age. However, civil rights do not trump my wife's rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. This tragic event also robbed Maryland students of a caring, dedicated, and effective speech therapist. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, now I'd like to ask Brock Pawlikoff to, uh, to present. Please, um, uh, you've got the floor. Thank you. Um, so I am uh, Deborah Friedman's daughter, and I just wanted to um, say that while it was my mom's untimely death that inspired advocacy in this area, this is about a lot more than my mom. Um, as a geriatric social worker, I see how difficult it is for seniors to give up their independence, sometimes in multiple areas of their lives, and I see the grief they feel when they do. However, sometimes the values of science and safety must outweigh the value of independence. The law we're proposing today is not at all radical. It's just bringing our state up to the standard that many other states have had for a long time. My colleague at LifeBridge Health, Jan Cry, an occupational therapist with 42 years of experience, wrote up some of her thoughts on this issue based on her unique experience as a certified driving rehabilitation specialist and a person who's very familiar with all the multiple sides of this issue and evaluate the driving of over 7,000 individuals. Um, so if you all, you probably all have her, um, the, the part that she wrote, but I just wanted you to pay attention, especially to the middle paragraph where she talks about um, how impairments in three key areas, vision, cognition, and motor function are responsible for higher crash rates for older drivers. Vision declines with age, cognition, which includes memory and attention can be impacted by medical problems such as dementia, and medication side effects, and motor function suffers as flexibility declines due to diseases such as arthritis. There often is a variety of other common healthcare issues like diabetes, strokes, cardiac problems. Many states routine, routinely attempt to identify, assess, and regulate older drivers with diminishing abilities who cannot or will not voluntarily modify their driving habits, like what happened with my, my mother. According to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, 18 states require older drivers to renew their licenses more often than the rest of the state's residents. In addition, 18 states require more frequent vision tests for older motorists. 16 states in the District of Columbia provide uh, prohibit older drivers from renewing licenses by mail or online. One state, Illinois, requires older drivers 75 and over to take a road test at renewal, and, and DC requires a doctor's approval for drivers over the age of 70 to renew their licenses. Thank you so much for considering this le legislation. Thank you to Delegate Stein, and may our me me mother's memory be a blessing. Thank you so much. And again, uh, let me express the uh, uh, condolences of uh, our entire committee for your loss. Thank you. Um, is Tyler uh, Simon there? I am. Thank you, Delegate uh, Barve and Delegate Stein for letting me speak. Um, my name is Tyler Simmet. I'm an internal medicine physician from Baltimore. And my goal is to talk about the medical aspects of aging and how it affects driving because driving is a critical risk for older people and it's where they come in contact with other people. We know as physicians that after 35 years of age, we start to age. Our body starts to deteriorate, it starts to change. Our abilities change and they change differently for different people. But basically we say the body is built to last 95 years. After 95 years, all bets are off. That's when the warranty is no longer any good. But after 50 years of age, you start to lose muscle mass. Between 50 and 70, people lose a lot of weight, they lose some cognition, and they lose about one third of their muscle mass. Between 70 and 80 years of age, they'll lose another one third of their muscle mass. And it's the loss of the muscle mass 
the slow reflexes, the deterioration of their vision that all figure into the driving risk that's greater with older drivers. We know that by 45 years of age, most people will have trouble standing on one leg for 30 seconds, called the one leg or 30 second stand test. And by 55 years of age, you, you lose the hip flexor strength so that you can't brake as quickly, you can't um, accelerate as quickly, and your ability to drive is deter deteriorates. It is possible to stave off the effects of aging with exercise. Um, practice and focus do help. But once you hit 80 years of age, it becomes difficult to, to block some of these aging changes. Um, this information leads me to conclude that testing is needed. And if you can't assess the skills individually, getting them scared that they're gonna be assessed is the next best thing. So having somebody have to walk into a motor vehicle organization to get tested is a surrogate for specific testing. It is a marker, it is an endpoint, and it really does help. So thank you for letting me testify. We have a question, uh, Delegate Healy. And you have to unmute yourself. There we are, thank you. Uh, I, I do want to first of all uh, express my condolences uh, for the terrible loss of life. And um, thank you for bringing this concept before us. I did support it before, but I, the question I have is about the uh, pandemic and um, the motor vehicle places are hard to access. Sometimes they're closed. Sometimes it's not safe to go there because of the disease that's stalking the world right now. And I was wondering if, if uh, even though we passed it in a certain form, this has come up in the, within the last year, maybe we should put some language in there to allow for some flexibility from the department to um, adjust things as necessary. Uh, Delegate, I'd be happy to consider that. I believe that FBA has offered flexibility about different kinds of renewals. Um, in light of COVID, I know, for example, in getting my vehicle emissions test, um, it was postponed by six months because of COVID. And so right. they're offering that kind of flexibility with respect to other renewals. But I'm happy to talk with you about that and see in general what type of um, flexibility MVA has been offering. You know, As long as it doesn't interfere with their opportunity to, to be flexible, I think that would be fine. It's sure. That. We just check with them. Sure. I will do that. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I have something in the chat here. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, that appears to be it for this bill. Uh, thank you very much. We will, that ends the public hearing on House Bill 296. We'll proceed to House Bill 311, Delegate Carr. And Anne, if you can un take down your hand, that would be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, colleagues. For the record, I'm Delegate Al Carr, and I'm here to present Bill 311. This is a bill that would allow local jurisdictions to enforce a don't block the box or do not enter uh, intersection at um, sign intersections. This is a law that many jurisdictions have, but in Maryland, that is currently unenforceable. So the bill is identical to House Bill 70 that passed the House of Delegates in uh, last year, thanks to the good work of this, uh, this committee. And uh, I think it's a big safety improvement and I ask for your favorable report. Okay, uh, any, uh, any questions for the sponsor? Uh, seeing none, um, we'll proceed. Uh, uh, it looks like Josh Howe signed up uh, as information. Uh, are you, uh, Josh, are you there? He's with Compass uh, Government Relations. I, I don't know if he's made a mistake in signing up for in, in, as informational, but- uh, He wasn't in the waiting room. He's not in the waiting room? Mm -mm. Okay, well then that ends the, I think that's everybody who wanted to offer a, 
uh, verbal testimony. So oral testimony rather. So uh, that ends the public hearing on House Bill 311. We'll proceed to uh, the last bill of the afternoon, House Bill 346. Delegate Carr, you're up again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Al Carr. I'm here to present House Bill 346. Uh, House Bill 346, it's identical to House Bill 38, which passed the uh, House of Delegates in 2020. Uh, thank you to this committee. It did not pass the Senate in the abbreviated uh, session. But under this bill, a, the uh, MVA and the MDTA would uh, no longer be able to, to uh, suspend a vehicle registration uh, for the purposes of collecting toll debt. They would still be able to flag a registration for non-renewal which is uh, a very effective uh, way of uh, enforcement and collection. Uh, this would put Maryland uh, in uh, among the best practices of the states uh, and uh, help to curb uh, a practice which is arguably criminalizes poverty. Uh, it passed the House of Delegates unanimously and I ask for your favorable report. All righty then, any questions for the sponsor? I got a question. Go for it. Uh, Delegate Carr, if, it, if it's an out-of-state driver, what, what's, the, uh, what's the procedure on, on a suspension? Uh, thank you, Delegate. So if, you, so if, you, if you're getting, a, if it's an out-of-state driver that, that, uh, that gets a bunch of penalties, you know, what's the ramification for them? Thank you, Delegate. That's a great question. So currently, Maryland does not have any reciprocity agreements with other states. So it, it is difficult for Maryland to collect from out-of-state drivers because Maryland doesn't have the ability to, to uh, flag a, a tag for non-renewal from another state. Uh, they could theoretically do that in the future if Maryland were to reciprocity agreement, but that has not happened yet. So under current law, the only ones being flagged are Maryland residents. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Delegate uh, Frazier Dalgo. Yeah, just, just to confirm, this is in the same exact posture as last year. That is correct. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Um, I don't see any, so, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, Franz, uh, Franz Schneiderman has signed up uh, to testify in favor. Franz, are you there? Is he in the way? I'm unmuting. Hello, can you hear me now? There you are, got it. Okay, you, you got good. You. Thank you, Chairman Barbe, Delegate Carr, and members of the committee. Good to see everyone again, albeit virtually. Uh, my name is Franz Schneiderman. I'm executive director of Consumer Auto. We work with consumer friendly auto dealers and consumer advocates for safety and fairness and transparency for Maryland drivers. I'm here to support uh, HB 346 because we do feel, as Delegate Carr mentioned, that the practice of suspending registrations uh, for these kind of toll fines is unduly punitive and particularly tends to criminalize poverty and tends to be a burden that falls hardest on poor Marylanders who are the people who often don't have easy passes and often um, you know, can't afford to pay the tolls that they do accrue. Um, I should say I, I made a mistake in the written testimony about the lim limiting the cost of the fines. This is, applies only to suspensions. I'll uh, you know, edit that when I can re-upload the testimony. But the practice of suspending these registrations hits a lot of folks. I believe the figure is about 22,000 Marylanders between 2015 and 2018 had their licenses suspended. This creates a kind of liability trap where obviously a lot of people continue to drive uh, because they need to to get to work or to meet their needs, even with a suspended license, license and that causes further legal trouble and further costs. And it's just a down, downhill spiral, particularly for low-income Marylanders. 
Um, and I think the problem is getting going to get worse now that we're at all cashless tolling, which puts more burden on people who don't have easy passes. So as I understand it, Maryland is one of only eight states that continues to suspend registrations for unpaid toll fines. So I'm confident Maryland can join the 42 other states that finds a way to enforce these rules without suspending the registration. And I uh, support the bill and ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you very much, Franz. And that means that the public hearing on House Bill 346 is over. It ends the bills for today. It's only been an hour, relatively painless. That's a good thing. Uh, Trish, though, has some announcements she'd like to make.